the spring, I have counted 136 different kinds of weather inside 24 hours. For Missouri, so that's close enough. Yeah, it was close enough. And the other thing I read said, finally, my winter fat will be gone, only to be traded by spring rolls. <laughs> Isn't that good? That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so we're here. It's spring, and I'm happy. Happy, my happy place. <laughs> All right. Life Talks tackles real, relevant, and practical topics with biblical teaching and engaging discussion. So this morning... We didn't preload any questions. It's all for you. So go ahead and text or email the Lifeway, no, Life Talks at the LifewayChurch.net, and we would be glad to field your questions and, and ask our guests today. So let's, let's um, dive in today. Last week, we had a discussion about the importance of having a strong ministry to children and students, especially in the day in which we live. It was called Investing in Our Children and our future. We talked about Lead Academy, and we talked about summer camp and our future with the daycare. It was a great topic, and you can find that in the archives of the Lifeway page, both on YouTube and Facebook, if you'd like to go back and watch that. Today, we are adding a very important layer to this discussion, because we have with us brother and sister Borlick, hailing from yeah. Indiana. Yeah. The yeah. Borlick family has been involved Get ready for this. In children's ministry since 1993. Can you believe that? That's a long time. Man. That is so awesome. I think we were eight years old. I think you were. Exactly. Maybe 10. They have ministered in crusades, district and regional rallies, children's camps, BBS, teacher training, consulting with churches about children's ministry structure and administration, puppetry training, outreach, and working with special needs kids. So basically anything children, yeah, they have done it. We are delighted to have them with us today. Let's give them a hand. Yeah. That's awesome. We're excited to excited. have you. Excited. We also have Brother Joe Hickey with Joe us, Hickey. our children's minister is children's here. Minister, We're so glad yeah. that he is here. That's awesome. Thank you for joining with us, we've and had, let's get started. We've had three, three, the last two weeks, we've had three generations of children's pastors we have. on the stage. That's we awesome. have. It's been amazing. All right, so let's start. We're going to dive right in talking to the Borlicks and asking questions. So whoever goes first is fine with me, but let's start. What got you involved in children's ministry that many years ago? Wow. Well, 1993 isn't necessarily the full truth. Both of us started separately as teenagers, had a burden for kids in, in two separate different churches, and each one of us were already kids ministers of a sort. It wasn't a thing back then, but, but we had a heart for it. And then I ended up at her church in 91 or so, and we just clicked in so many ways. And we're still clicking now. That's awesome. That's and a good thing to hear. Keep on clicking. That's a good thing. Keep on clicking. And, and so once we clicked children's ministry-wise, it, it was gangbusters since then. That's awesome. Was it, did, so did you start in the 80s? Just, just tell, no, tell, tell okay, the story. Okay. Tell the story. Because that would be really impressive if you went, if you had, if your if your children's ministry spanned five decades. Okay, so even though I'm not old enough for that to I be know. true, <laughs> it's like yeah, exciting for you, Pastor. <laughs> right. <laughs> in a in a way, it is true because I was a teenager, believe it or not, in the '80s, and I had a youth leader who had a heart for kids. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. But I didn't. Oh. I, I I was 17, 18 years old, 16 yeah. years old. And I was too cool for that. Absolutely. And so he wanted to start a kids' ministry, and he wanted to use the youth class. But none of us would raise our hand when he would ask for a volunteer. And he said, okay, that's it. I'm putting all your names in a bag. I'm shaking it up, and I'm going to pull the name out of who's going to help us in kids' ministry. And lo and behold, guess whose name it was. Kind of like drawing lots, yeah, right? It, yeah, exactly. And I drew the sto short straw. And, and so we, we assisted him with a puppet minister. And it just kind of grew from there for me. It, it, it clicked. It's what God called me to do. I, I struggled as a young man when I knew that I had a call to preach, and, and yet I'm not a normal preacher. Uh, I use jokes. I'm, I'm, I'm funny. I'm weird. And I'm not the screaming behind a pulpit That's suit right. and tie kind of That's guy. So and I struggled with that for the longest time, the longest time, um, until God finally showed me, told me about Moses. What's, what's that in your hand? Use what you have. Thank Use you. what I've given you. And so since since I surrendered to God, it's clicked. That's such a great story. 
Uh, well, mine was not as great as his. I grew up a fringe kid. Um, I didn't have the right parents. I didn't have the right background. I didn't have the right clothes. So I was always on the outskirts of everything. And when I hit about 13, 14 years old, we had other kids at the church, younger than me, who were also on the outskirts. They were the fringe kids. And so I just started saying, hey, I'll stay at the church with them today. And I would keep them between services on Sundays, 14 years old. We'd stay there. They'd bring their lunch. And it just kind of grew from there to where I, I did everything I could with those children. And what he didn't bother to tell you is we had actually met many, many years before when I was seven and he was 11. And he was absolutely adorable. And so I told him at seven years old I was going to marry him. She was prophetic. I was. <laughs> or, he showed up pathetic. at our church. <laughs> he showed up at my church in 1991, and I just saw the back of him walking around to enter the door. And I looked, and I said, that man walks like Bruce Borlick. And my mom goes, how would you know that? Lo and behold, there it was. And this time I didn't, I didn't have to chase him. So it was kind of nice. But just from there, he joined me keeping the kids after church. We started taking them ice skating, taking them to McDonald's, and here we are. We're still doing it. <laughs> Joe, I just want to sort of send it over to you because I mentioned this morning I was talking to your dad and about children's ministry and how and the importance of stories. In fact, that's what you, you know she had just mentioned. And children's ministry is so much about stories, and 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 it's it's not just the stories of the, of the way we contextualize the, the 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 doctrines or the faith or whatever, but also the stories that cause us to understand that there's. There's lives and there's families and backgrounds and all of these things. And, and uh, you know, um, I was talking to your dad today. He may be still. Oh, there he is. Brother Kevin Hickey. And they've been involved. Brother Hickey, how, how, when was it when you guys first got involved in children's ministry? That is so. Bro, I, are you serious? Listen, can I tell you something really cool? I did not know that. We talked to the audience here. <laughs> I did not know that. Listen to this. I came from b back from Bible college, or I came home from Bible college, married my wife. My, so we, we located at my father-in-law's church here in Ohio. And my father-in-law said, you don't love kids enough. Mm. And, and I had just come from Bible college, and he said, so you and Stephanie are going to teach the six and seven-year-old class. I didn't know he that, He about cried. No, I, I did about <laughs> cry. Well, here's the deal. Not because I didn't like kids, but because of the fact that my dad was a basketball coach. I was raised in southern Illinois, and you know basketball, and I, well, you're a Hoosier, so, you know, there's a co competition between who are the real Hoosiers, really, you know? And so, and, and, and so here's what's crazy. So I'm like, I looked at my father-in-law, and I'm like, I think you've lost your mind. I said, I've never been around kids. I've, I've, I've only been around guys. I don't, you know, whatever. And he said, well, you're going to learn to love them. And he said, and so he put, and so I looked at her and I said, you're going to teach it. I'll just turn the pages for you or something. <laughs> but that is a man. I did not know that. And yesterday, yeah, so last night after we got done with the, so we had a, a training session with our teachers, our, our children's ministry staff and whatever. And Joe got up and started getting kind of teary eyed and choked up as he was talking, you know, a little. And, and I, I told Brother Hickey, not only does that heart come from your dad, but also that heart for children's ministry. And isn't it interesting that it's, that it is multi generational? And yeah, so uh, I mean, think it back when I first wanted to, uh, I felt that I, I needed to be involved in ministry. I never thought that children's ministry was the place I was going to end up at. Um, but, but it is really cool to, to see um, how, how easy it is, not easy all the time, but um, how much more receptive kids are um, to the message of, of, of so Jesus versus sometimes older people that have been around the block and seen things and has had life happen to them. Um, but, but children are so much easier to reach. Um, and, and be able to be involved in their life. And, and uh, yeah, like I said, I, I, I wasn't expecting to be involved in children's ministry at all, but um, I remember back when uh, my dad was a children's pastor for a while and started up the puppet team, and he said, hey, you guys want to help me? I said, nope, don't, don't want to do it. <laughs> and, and my dad can tell you to this day, I mean, him and my brother would be in the garage building puppets, and they said, hey, do you want to come help us? Nope, I'm good. Uh, so I'd always find something else to do. Yeah. Uh, it, but yeah, I never thought that I'd be here, but so it's, it, it so is awesome cool. to be here now. Isn't that amazing? Wow. 
and LifeWay is blessed and thankful for that. And thank you, Brother Hickey, that you uh, that you somehow you snuck that into him, whether it was genetically <laughs> or through intercession, one or the other. Yeah, I got the genetics of children's ministry and not the hair genetics. So that <laughs> hopefully. Happens, okay. Hold on. <laughs> Brother Hickey says, and I'm still interceding. (laughs) All right, let's talk a little about the changing landscape of children's ministry in our culture. Your children's ministry obviously spans four decades, maybe even five. So I believe that uniquely postures you to really speak about what we are doing and need to be doing as churches and families in this particular time. One of the statements from last week was this. There was a time when the world... Even people who were not overtly Christian in their worldview had some clear markers pertaining to what Chris, what conduct should be done around children and the kind of movies they should see. We talked about the Dick Van Dyke show and how they, the two at Laura, and yeah, they slept in yeah. twin beds. I mean, it was just, there was just this, <laughs> this guideline and this border. It used to be that certain television shows could not air until 8 or 9 p.m. after children went to bed. But boy, those times have drastically changed. Not only are our children not protected in those ways, but many times they are targeted. I know that there is nothing new under the sun, but it sure seems like the enemy has made children an open game for attacks that were reserved for teenage years and later. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? A a little bit. Anyone who's been around for a little while, more than a few decades, has realized that culture has changed so much. And it's happening so fast now exponentially it's happening True. it's changing and and it's just swirling so true. and it's it's mind-blowing things that used to make us blush 20 30 years ago are now commonplace right. which makes me wonder should the lord tarry 20 30 years from now things that make us blush now will it be commonplace and so culture has changed and along with that children's ministry has to change, has to adapt in order to be relevant, in order to be effective. Think on it this way. If, if you're a missionary and you're going to a country that's very foreign or different, if you're going to Asia, for example, you need to learn the culture. They're different from us. They do things differently. They think differently. They even read differently. And so right. when ministering to kids, you need to learn the culture. You need to understand the way that they think the way that they act, and why they do what they do in order to effectively minister Mm -hmm. to that. So children's ministry, I often say, is a four-letter word, W-O-R-K. It's not something we can just haphazardly do and pick up our manual on Saturday night and say, oh, it's Jonah and the whale. I got this. I can wing it. Oh, I know that story. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I I can do this. No no problem. And, And so as culture change changes we need to change we need to adapt we don't change the the message but we do change our methods there are so many things trying to get the attention of our kids and we need to be as effective as we can there are so many things trying to get the attention of our kids and so it's not bad to be entertaining in kids ministry but not only do you need to be entertaining you need to be anointed in what you're doing What changes have you seen in the church's mindset regarding children's ministry and how it's done? I'm sure over the years, I I can tell you there's changes. We've we've seen a lot, and we've seen none. This is is exactly where we go. We see some churches who have decided we've got to be the biggest, the best, the brightest, the flashiest. We've got to have the most games, the greatest prizes, the most things going on. But they forget that the purpose of the church is to give our children a foundation, something that they can build on that's going to last them. So we see churches that are going so deeply into the flash and the lights that they're forgetting the ministry aspect. And we also see churches that refuse to change with culture. Mm -hmm. And they're still trying to reach children the same way they did in 1972. And they're wondering why their kids aren't coming, why their kids aren't retained it's because you have to change with the times even when we treat teach them the same truth we have to make it relevant to children today and where they're living 
and what is, is normal for them. Um, I got to, during COVID, I got to help with some of our families so that the parents could work, the kids weren't in school, so I got to go and be the designated adult. Yeah, not something people usually use to describe me. Uh, but sitting in their homes while their children are supposed to be doing school, there was not a book to be seen. There was not a pencil. They didn't have to look anything up. Everything was on the screen. Huh. So when we go into Sunday school and we're still teaching from a book that's so, that's with so papers, that's so dense. that is foreign right. to these children. And, and their brain probably isn't even wired to. It's not. It's not. So we have to find that, that happy medium that's between the flash and between the old ways and make sure that we're putting the foundations of ministry into them. Amen. That's so good. You know, um, it, it's, it, it is so interesting because we, we know we can't do the flannel graph. You know, that's, that's just, you know. I don't know. It might be although, cool although, now. Although some people can. <laughs> well, that's I, I, true. I've seen it done, and, and they use all the strange voices and, and are able to withhold their attention. And, and it's rare. And it's that, very that, rare. It takes somebody pretty special. And, but, but I do think that, um, that, that, that it's interesting because we, make, we do kind of make fun of, you know, like, well, you can't reach kids anymore using flannel graph, graph boards and doing it like you used to do it and so on and so forth. But, you know, what's funny is, is that when we got ready to, when we got ready to build, we had, a, we had a season of growth just ahead of building here. And so what we decided to do was the, 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 the contractor basically said, if you'll, if you'll build a new sanctuary, it's so much cheaper to build because you don't have all the rooms and whatever. And you already have rooms and stuff on the other side. So why don't you turn that into... Your, your children's ministry space and whatever. And he says the only downside is, is we, you know, we kind of had planned to do sort of the, the playland experience and it was going to be, you know, the slides and the, and it was going to, you know, and all that stuff. But you know, what's really weird is, and, and he's a Baptist guy and, and, and his thought was, yeah, you know, the biggest growing churches, they've all got the, you know, they've got the slides and the play sets and stuff like that. And I'm like, I, you know, like like in a way, I look at that and say, okay, there may be a cool factor to that, but you've only got these kids for, in some contexts, an hour is a is the max, and they're if they play for thirty minutes, what, and they're going to eat a snack for ten, you've got twenty minutes for picking them out. Yeah. I mean, have you? What is your thoughts about that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, our kids are bombarded. They're bombarded with negative messages from every aspect, over the media, in, in public schools, sometimes at home. And so, just like you said, we have an hour a week. And how many hours are there in a week? Do you know, do you know off the top of your head, anyone? But, and so, we have to be effective. We have to be anointed. I really believe that, we're, that things are winding up. And, and so... We have to be effective. We tend to use what we call the funnel method in everything that we do. When our kids come in, our ministry starts at the door. We run the Wednesday night programming at our home church. We structure it and everything. And it starts the moment they come in the door. And for the first half hour, it's nothing but fun and games. We open our doors at 630. Mm -hmm. And from 630 to 7, they rotate through four stations where it's crazy games and it's adults having conversations with children, investing in our children for really half an hour. When 7 o'clock comes, our kids all go to their spots. We open with prayer. And then we go into our whole session where it's a funnel method. It's lots of fun. And as we get closer and closer to time, we cut out the fun until at the very end, it's just you and Jesus. And that has worked very, very well for us because our emphasis is on an experience with Jesus, taking something home with you. So we have to make sure that while we give them what they want, which is the fun, we are funneling that out to where we're focused on ministry by the time we get to the end. Joe, last night, um, the, one of the, I, I love the story about uh, that one of you guys told in talking about in, in involving their senses. And, and one of you, it might have been your sister boy, who told about the, the, the teacher who made the cake or the out of the crust yeah. graham cracker crust with Something like with jello yeah. uh like blue jello with like white caps from whipped cream and whatever and little teddy grahams walking across like there was a center cut out of it and the teddy grahams were walking through the red sea what do you feel like when you're when you're um your staff last night 
or hearing those kinds of things, what, what, do you, what, what impact do you think that has on being able to, A, create a multi-sensory experience, but also understanding the importance of sort of this funnel thing and connecting with the kids? Yeah, so, so it's all a, um, it, it, I mean, it starts with a challenge, right? Um, so it's the challenge is how, how do we become, and, and the reason, um, you know, just to backtrack a little bit, the, the Borlicks have been doing this ministry for a while, and for people like myself, they make it real easy because on their website, they say, hey, here's the things that we teach about. <laughs> what, what do you want us to talk about? Uh, so so that's, what, that's what we picked last night. Um, and so, I mean, specifically, we, we went in with, with the idea of, you know, we, we want to be able to, to find ways to better connect with our kids. And, and before the session last night, um, the Borlicks asked every, every teacher individually, your name, what class you teach, and what, uh, what concerns do you have or, or things you, that you would like to hear from the session. And other than maybe two or three of us, pretty much everyone said, how to engage better with the children. That's so yeah. good. So uh, all the ideas and everything that they said were, were ways that we can better engage. So um, it, it, as a teacher myself, so I, I'm, my wife and I taught the 10 or 11 year old class for, I mean, I taught it for about eight or nine years. And then Rebecca taught it for two or three years along with me. And it's, it's so easy to snack, to just go to Tim Hortons and grab a, a box yeah. of donuts or um, grab some Oreos or something like that from the store. But to actually put some intentionality behind that. So it. Well, it's so funny yeah. when, when, when Sister Borlick, when you said last night, it's like, you know, you see stuff like that and you're like, that level of creativity. And she made a funny statement. She says, and I, I was thinking, you know, if I go grab some bugles for the j walls of Jericho, <laughs> Yes. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like I got bugles for the walls of Jericho, <laughs> man. That's yeah, creative. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there are, but, but it's, in, but what, what is cool is there are some people that are sort of naturally creative and, and, and then there's some people who, who, who maybe aren't, but can learn. But I think this third piece sometimes is that, that these types of things as a pastor, because I know that sometimes there's such thing as like. Like, like compassion fatigue, you know, that you get as a pastor. I think it's possible to get compassion fatigue and as teachers, like constantly being like, Phew, man, I feel like every week I'm having to, you know, pull a rabbit out of the hat. Sure. That's tough, isn't it? Especially if there are behavioral issues and if there are ongoing behavioral issues, it, it is enough to wear you down. Yeah. So, and, and that robs your creativity in a little bit, doesn't it? It does, it can, yes. If you're not... It can. It, it, it robs your creativity and also when you feel like you've poured into it and poured into it and poured into it and you're not getting the response that you want to see and you feel like, okay, why am I doing this? Nobody really cares. Why am I doing this? Usually what we recommend and what we try to do ourselves is if you've poured into something and you're not getting the response, do something different. Yeah. Do something different. If your take-home papers that you've put all the thought into it aren't working, you're not getting the response, do something different. So good. You know, just just change it up. It'll it'll relieve that stress on you of having to be so over the top creative. And don't ever discount the simple things. That is so, so the good. simple things are great. We put out a, a prize box two weeks ago at just with one word on the front of it. Ask. We had just taught the story of Aksa, Caleb's daughter, who had the, the bravery to go and ask for what she needed. And we need to go and ask God for what we need. So we just put one side, no take home papers, no goodie bags, just one box with mm. the word ask mm. on the front. And it totally changed everybody's perspective. All of a sudden there was new energy in there because we changed it and went to something simple. And it also reinforced the lesson that we were teaching. So often God doesn't bless us because we don't ask him to. Right. And you have not because you ask not. And it was the, w kind of the ASK, ask, seek, and knock. And yes. Yeah. You, you, know, you know what's interesting? I'll tell you something interesting. So, so one of the things that th – this was, this was something that sort of connected last night as I was, you know, kind of listening to you guys talk about – let's see, what was it, what was it that, that, that really caused it to connect last night was when you were talking about um, buttering Jesus up. You don't ask something, so you said ask, and it popped in. And you said when you're when you're praying and you get ready to ask something, you come into his courts with praise. And so you don't you don't just go ask mom, and you know you certainly don't say you know I know you're probably not gonna give it to me. You never 
you know, you're never giving me what I want and whatever. And, you know, and you, and you, you had like, you said kind of bus kids. And so you're like, so, so in some ways you've got to start off kind of buttering Jesus up, you know, you got to tell him, Jesus, that sky you made yes, last night, that sunset was amazing. And you do what you do so well. I'll tell you something interesting. And this is something that I, I never connected the dots on this. But <clears throat> so my brother and I do consultation with churches to create multiplication movements and turn people into missional believers who have spiritual conversations with people. And one of the things that we say is this, for too long, we've said that milk is truth light. And we said, and, and so what we try to teach people is, is no, milk isn't truth light. Milk isn't like miniature truth. Milk is what happens when women of childbearing age eat meat and through the process of their body produce milk for underdeveloped digestive systems. Mm. And it never dawned on me till mm. now that the best children's ministry and Sunday school teachers are people who are able to, because the OXA story, I'm like, you know, to take something that is a pretty meaty, I mean, that's a Old Testament story, kind of unfamiliar. And buddy, you better have consumed that story as a teacher. Like, I feel the Holy Ghost right here. <laughs> you better have consumed that story as a teacher, as a spiritual conversationalist, so that when it comes out of you, it's all the truth. It's just broken down as milk. Yeah, yeah. So many times we look at those stories in the Bible as just stories, but there are so many truths and so many things we could grasp and pull from them. But then you need to exactly break it down for a child to be able to understand that they're the same truths at their level. So yeah. good. So this question says, and I know we've touched on this a little bit, but how about the changes that cultural changes have put on your ministry? So how has it changed what you do? I knew you still have your puppets, and you've had those for a long time. So what changes have had to happen because of cultural changes? First of all, we can't go as long. We, it, it used to be we could go an hour and a half and, and hold everyone's attention, but but now everything is so quick and put into bite size, yeah, three you know, five three or five minute chunks exactly, and and so we have we've had to streamline. We really have. We we have some sermons that we've been doing for twenty years still effective, but they've had to be streamlined and cut and just focused and directed to be able to be effective Very in good. that. An another thing is it's difficult to give a cold altar call now. Be because, first of all, no, e even in adults, nobody's a sinner anymore. E everything's been watered down so much. And so to reach and to draw and to grab, and nobody wants to be that first person to come up to the altar, especially as you get into the double-digit ages. They don't want that pressure of everybody looking at them, etc. And so we've had to come up with a way to be able to bring them to the altar. We try to involve them in the story that we're telling and if you'll, if you'll watch later today or, or tune in later today, you'll, you will see that we have a hook. We're going to try to bring the kids up before we give the altar call, weaving them and involving them in the story so that they're caught up in what's going on and don't even realize it. Oh, I'm up here and I'm, I'm praying now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We do it that way. And the other thing that we've really had to watch and be aware of is the woke cancel culture there are things that we can't talk about. There's places we can't go. We have to be so very careful in how we present biblical truth because we're reaching more than just the church. We're trying to reach everybody. So we have to be non-offensive. Right. And that can be tough. Right. We, we have one sermon. It's the earthworm. And we talk about how God created the earthworm. It's magnificent. It's incredible. But, you know, we have a character who thinks the earthworm needs to be changed and he's the expert and he can listen to the expert because he knows what's best and he starts changing what god created and causing more wow. problems wow. for the and, earth and so it works on different levels for those so good. Th that understand what we're really talking about it can click for them but we don't have to break it down so much for a child who can understand that yes god made me special and created me spiritually and in his Im in his image mm. For, for anybody who thinks children's ministry is just telling a little story and 
<coughs> Come on now, that's that's awesome though. But I love how you also reach to the adults while you're ministering to the kids, and that's amazing. We have to. We 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 like to throw nuggets in there for the adults. Maybe even some jokes and some humor that kids won't get, but the adults can laugh at as well. And when the adults are laughing. The kids, and, and they're engaged, it also brings the kids in as well, especially in a room like this. When you laugh later today, the kids are going to respond to that laughter, even if they don't understand the joke and get in. So laugh. Feel free to laugh. <laughs> Spe speaking of that, there's something powerful about humor because it breaks down barriers. You can come into church with your arms folded and grouchy, but you get someone to laugh. They unfold their arms, they drop their guard, and then you can... Hit him, in, hit him in the nose with the gospel. <laughs> That's so good. What about you, Joe? What do you think about what changes you have seen culturally in Sunday school? So, I, I mean, the biggest thing to me. Because you're still a young one, too. Uh, well, no. Yeah. I'm super old now. Kind we we of. talked about this yeah. last night. Yeah. So, um, so to me, uh, so when, when I taught the class, even just a few years ago, um, we had a different service format, and we'd be in Sunday school for an yeah. hour and a half to two hours. Yeah. And then when we had that amount of time there, we were still felt like we were kind of pushing for time a little bit and we wish we had a little bit more time. So with the new service format, we only have that hour now. Um, and with the hour still, we're, I mean, we're, we're pushing it, yeah. but, but the kids are still running out of, of energy a lot quicker than they used to. Um, and, and then the, the one big thing with the, uh, with the curriculum changes, some of the things that we've done. So before it was just all books. Um, and now there's each week there's a, a, a little multi um, whatever there's there's different there yeah there you go multimedia that's the big thing someone's been searching for there, there you go all, all those good words uh, but but there is a, a media piece for each lesson that goes along with it um, that that you, you know kids in just to talk about my kids personally my kids could go home and watch some silly random show all day long um, and like they they don't mind that when I was a kid I mean we uh, we didn't have a TV for the longest time ever we didn't have internet we didn't have cell phones and I'm not that old but I'm I'm old um, so we have to find a way to engage kids on where they are and I mean kids are if you look at the kids in, in church there's a lot of kids that you'll see walking around with a phone in their hands that five six seven years old um, when when I was a kid they didn't, yeah that wasn't a thing and again I'm I'm young ish. Um, <laughs> that's for those at home, that was my dad laughing at me. <laughs> but um, but but yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have a cell phone for a really long time, so it's finding new ways to engage with kids and, and to be to be involved in their lives. We talked about we were just talking about Lead Academy, and I I can't believe the difference in kids today, even from when we did it before, which is what six years ago maybe. The creativity is like so much less. I mean, they'll go to write a story or write a sentence and just can't hardly do it. Imagination, like everything Imagine has been it, imagined yeah. for them. Everything's, yeah, everything's done for them. Yes, so they've not had to do it, and it's been a real, it's been a real my challenge. My mom used to say, my mom used to say, we, we would start getting rambunctious or whatever, and my mom used to say, you guys go outside and play. Go get on your right, go take a bike ride. Yeah. So the, the one thing I'll tag on is, is that when I was a kid, uh, and I, I used to love playing with Legos, and there's kids now that would rather watch people play with Legos on YouTube than yeah, play with them them sorry, themselves. Yeah. Yes. Wow, what an interesting observation. That is, wow, that's really cool. Wow. All right, so my final question for you, and then we're going to take your questions, so go ahead and send those in, is what advice do you have for parents today? That's pretty broad, isn't it? With, with all that you just said and all that we just talked about, parenting still is a responsibility. And, and honestly, parents need to be in parents. With all that's being thrown in our kids across the media, you need to be aware of what they're involved in. You need to do a little bit of research. There are things that look innocent that aren't necessarily innocent or have little little subtle things thrown at our kids. You need to be aware. And, and it sounds intimidating, but there are all kind of great resources, all kind of websites that you can look at that, that review media things, some Amen. from a Christian standpoint, some just from a, a secular standpoint. There, there's uh, pluggedin.com, done by Focus on the Family, that has a review of, of media of every, of every sort, 
And there's also, what's the one with the, with the stoplight system? Common Sense Media. Common Sense Media. And it'll have a stoplight system like, like red for younger kids, yellow for older kids, green for, for adults. And so it'll give you a common sense perspective on some of the media. But, but parents need to be aware. And it's okay to send your kids outside to play. You are the parent. You are the adult. You know what's best for your child. Same thing in your classroom. You are the parent. You are the, the teacher. And don't be afraid to be the teacher. And, and let me just throw this in there on a side note. You're the teacher Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. Friday, Saturday, and not just on Sunday morning. Yeah. The only thing I can say to parents in, in this context is don't be afraid to communicate with the children's ministry workers at your church. If your kid's having a rough time, tell them. Let them know. We instituted a policy at our church about a year ago. It's just called Handle with Care. And all of our parents know, and they have our phone numbers, if they text us the word, Handle with Care, sometimes I get an HWC, that just tells us my kid's having a rough time. They need a little bit extra patience. They need a couple extra hugs. We don't need to know the details. We just need to know that something is going on so that we can love on your kids That's just it. a little bit extra. Don't be afraid to tell your Sunday school teacher, hey, we had a really rough weekend at home. Because the more information that we have, the better we can help you to reach your kids. That is good. I know at school, a lot of times a parent will text me and say, hey, we had a rough morning. Just, just so you know. I don't know how it's going to be when they get there. But wow, it does because you have a lot more patience. You, you take that extra time with them. That's very Most of the time we'll say, why are they behaving like this? Yes. What is going on? But there's usually a reason for that behavior. This is a great, great question that came in. A parent who is not a member of the church wants to have their children come to Sunday school because they want God's influence on their child's life, but they hesitate because they are afraid to let their kids go with strangers. With all of the fears of strangers and kids, how do we overcome this issue? One thing that comes to mind right off the bat is bring that parent in, walk them through what you're doing, introduce them to the teachers, introduce them to the other students, and, and begin a relationship with them, a closer relationship with them to help them feel more comfortable with mm -hmm. what you have going on. We've done that. We've also done what we call parking lot parties. We'll take a Wednesday night and we'll go outside and we'll blitz the neighborhood within walking distance and invite them all come. And that's a time when we've had people say, hey, my neighbor's been wanting to send their kid, but they don't know anybody. Have them come Wednesday night. We're going to be outside. It's going to be fun. And we had 17 brand new families who had never been to our church cross our parking lot the last Wednesday we did this. And we had five of them show up the next Sunday. Um, so it, just to open it up, as he said, introducing people. Make sure they have your contact information. Make sure you've made that contact with them. If you need to, go over to their house, drop them off a goodie bag. Hey, I just wanted a chance to meet you. We love your kids. We also would do a follow-up when a child would come. We would call the parent the next day. You'd be amazed at the times that when I would call, the first words were, what did they do? <laughs> and it was, no, I just want to thank you for sharing them with us. And we would point out one feature of that child. They have such a beautiful smile. Their eyes were so gorgeous. Whatever it was, they had a fantastic sense of humor. We would just make that personal connection to remove that fear of, I don't know you. It used to be that parents and teachers were working hand in hand for the betterment of their child. But nowadays, if, if a teacher has an issue and gets on the child, the parent gets defective and, th and they're like this, not my baby, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> so, so we need yeah. to have a, a better parent-teacher relationship, I, I think. That's so good. What, what, ab what about, because um, I, I do think that this is, it really is a, a, a big thing today. It's, it's, it's really strange because I think that sometimes our, our children trying to think of how to say this. Sometimes parents who might not personally be invested in their own spiritual growth or they're, they're like, eh, you know, I don't know. But yet they have a mindset that says, but I want my children to be at church. I want my children to learn or, or whatever. Or they may just want them to have, you know, an hour and a half or two hours of babysitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure. But how have you found that that, that, that kind of a ministry can can a be effective that 
because you told some stories last night about children who have come back and, and, and have never forgotten the seeds that you planted and the things that God did in their life. But also maybe speak to that and beyond to the development of that relationship with the parent so that those parents begin to see that, you know what, I need to probably be leading the charge here. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. You go first. <laughs> he stood in me first because I do this every week. Every week that we are home, my goal is trying to make that connection with the parents of our, our unchurched so that they want to come. They want to be a part of it. Um, we do a lot of reach out phone calls, a lot of follow up letters. Um, I have a team that works with me. I have six other people and we divide up the responsibility and they'll stop by and drop something off to a parent. Hey, we just want to make sure you have the information. We have two great big events getting ready to happen for our children um, and they are specifically designed to bring the parents in. The first one that's going to be happening is Holiday Kids Convention. We're keeping our kids overnight for 24 hours, but the four to seven year olds have to go home on Friday night. I'm not keeping Absolutely. four year olds overnight, no, but, but their parents are going to have to come and pick them up ah, okay. and they have to come pick them up. And oh, you know what? They're going to be singing. You need to come and see them sing. It's going to be amazing. Come and see them sing. So I already have parents asking what time do I need to be there? How late is it going to go? As soon as they ask questions, we know we've got them. And then our other one is on, it's on a Sunday night and it is a kids art auction and kids can cook. It is an SOC fundraiser. Our kids are using their creativity and their imagination, what little we can pull out of them to create pieces of artwork that we are auctioning off to the highest bidder. And we are pulling the guilt trip. That's good. We are totally pulling the guilt trip. Oh, Grandma, you need to come. You don't want them to be the only one who doesn't get any bids. <laughs> Auntie, Uncle, you better come. And then kids can cook. I've got 17 children signed up right now. They're going to cook something and serve it after you pay a cover fee. $15 gets you in. You get to sample everything that these children have made. And the children are serving you. Again, pulling the guilt trip. You don't want them to be the only one that nobody votes for. Oh, my goodness. That would be awful. You just come along and put your little token in their jar. They'll, they'll remember that auntie came and voted for them. So, yeah, making that connection with the parent and the child, getting them in the door so that they can see not only do we love your children, we love you. That's what and you're welcome here. Keep in mind that we are fishers of men. And the best bait to use for parents and grandparents are their kids. Yeah. You, you have their kids involved in something, their kids are going to sing, their kids are going to cook, or whatever it is, that brings mom and dad in. Wow. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that, w one of the things that we, we talk a lot about, if, if we have any of you watched or listened to or watched the recording of the Mobilized Church podcast, one of the things we talk about probably every week is the fact that in the day and age in which we live, the church can't do church so good to attract uninterested people anymore. It, it, you know, like you said, there was a, you know, there, people, nobody's a sinner. No, and, 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 and more and more what we're learning is um, Ed Stetzer in his book, is the, the book Lost and Found, it's the largest LifeWay research um, group did the largest um, uh, study of millennials that had ever been done as, as it relates to questions of church and God and whatever. And what they found was that 40% of people are open to an invitation to a church service, mm. but of the same control group. Okay. So if your only way to get somebody <clears throat> into the house of God is through an invitation, you're about four out of 10 of, of your pool of people that would be potentially open to that kind of a thing. But what was interesting was, was that 80% of that same group said that they were open to a spiritual conversation about matters of faith with somebody that they trust. Mm. And what is interesting is, is what, what, what we like to talk about is, is that we're getting to the point where it's going to be increasingly difficult to reach people without relationship. Yeah. It's essential. Relationships are essential. This is what you guys are talking about with trying to create that co connection, trying to create that relationship. This yeah. says, um, somebody just posted, sent a text in that said tagging into what Sister Borlick stated 
a Harvard study showed that the first question people ask themselves when they meet someone new is, are they friend or foe? Yeah. This shows the importance of building are those connections. So we need to show ourselves friendly. Hello. Yeah, hello. We actually got to see some of that come out. When COVID was, had us all shut down, we were the first church in Indiana to reopen our kids' ministry on Wednesday night. Sunday school didn't open for another three months, but we reopened Wednesday nights. And we started, every time a child could not make it, we delivered their materials to their home. And one of these was a little girl who comes with a neighbor. Her mom and dad do not come to church. And we, did, we went to her home maybe three or four times. We engaged with the parents over their dog, of all things. They have a Great Dane. Scared me to death. My husband wanted to ride it. You know, but we engaged with them over their dog. It's like, it's like yeah. dude, I got a Shadow at home. Yes. <laughs> three weeks ago, I'm at the check-in desk checking kids in on Wednesday night, and that little girl came in. She's a regular. She comes in all the time. But she had her mother with her who never comes to church. And her mother said she can't stay tonight, but she wanted to come and bring her prayer request. So she drove all the way from Mishawaka, Indiana, two towns over to our church so that her daughter could bring a prayer request. Mama's not in church. Mama's going to yes. be in church. Yes. <laughs> That's so good. So good. So good. Man, that's so good. You know, Joe, and, and when I hear these kinds of things, and it, it, it really, you know, I know this has got to probably, you know, light you up as a, you know, children's ministry director. I think, you know, when we think about this, when, when like that statement that you just made or that Harvard study, that, that people, the first thing that they're asking themselves is, is this a friend or foe? I, I, think that the, I think that the devil has done a fabulous job. He's a good devil. I mean, as far as Joe what, as far as, yeah, exactly. I mean, as, as far as devils go, he's the best. Yeah. And he does his job well. And, and I think as it relates to creating a persona that, that the Christian community is hostile to the world, that it automatically preloads the mentality of so many people that you're automatically a foe. I don't even have to make the decision. You tell me you're a Christ follower, I already know you're a foe. Yeah. And so, so this has to really fire you up as a children's ministry director to say, there may be, there may be an opportunity that we've got that, that, that isn't preloaded because they already know we're a friend. Because of the love we give to their kids, I don't, what, what do you think? Is there anything there you want to add? Yeah. So um, the, the one thing that um, the one thing we, we make sure so in, in the background, all the teachers that we have, they've all been screened and approved by by the board here at Lifeway. Um, but but the one thing that we do is um, all of the teachers that we have back there. And if any of you would like to be a teacher sometime, I'd love to talk. Um, but man, they that was a shameless plug. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> shameless. It's fine. Uh, but l literally, some of the nicest people in the church and friendly. Um, and, and the one thing that, that I work on is, um, so in my in my side job, I, I'm a commercial insurance agent. And a lot of the people that I, I deal with like to get to the point and what are we doing and what are we talking about? Well, that's not how you deal with people here. And that's not how you deal with children. <coughs> so, so it comes down to building a relationship and, and building a relationship and building that trust so um, that, that we do have your child's best interest at heart. So good. And, and all the teachers back there are not back there because pastor twisted their arm and said, hey, you gotta, you're, you're going to be a teacher. That's what you're doing now. Yeah. Everyone that's back there is intentionally back there because they feel that God has called them specifically for that class and for the kids that are there that week. So, good. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's what we do. And, and then um, sometimes I am the children's director slash uh, greeter um, when when the kids come in the door, and uh, man, I, I'm a I'm a big dude. I, I'm 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 not a, a, a. Some kids are intimidated by me, and that's that's fine. I understand. Um, but so we very intentionally we we have Chelsea there that does check in most of the time now, and I like for Chelsea to be sometimes the first face that people see because. So Man, Chelsea is super nice. She always has a smile on her yeah, face, yeah. Um, and and yeah. kids kids love Chelsea and love seeing Chelsea. Not so much me all the time. So so 
some of those things that we do, we have to hire it out, but, but we do that intentionally so because good. we we want to build that trust and we, we want to we have people know that they're the people that are there are there for a reason and they're there for their good. Yeah. You know, to take his meat and break it down to melt to milk, what it comes down to is you loving their kids. And w as the parents are trying to decide if you're friend or foe, as they see you loving and having the best intentions for their kids, that is going to break down the yeah. friend and foe barrier. Good. Good, good. I know when we first moved here, there was a family that we saw out that I didn't really know. And, and they, they knew us. They, they came up and talked to us. But they had two children. And I just got down, talked to their kids, loved on them, and they ended up coming. And they said the reason was because I loved on their kids. Mm -hmm. So that's, it is very, very important. We have one more question that we're gonna ask before it's time to go. It says, what are some tools to help parents stay connected with their children at home? <laughs> there are those, those media websites that, that were just talked about and they're plugin.com and what's the other one? Help me again. And Common Sense Media, thank you so much. <laughs> and, and so if you wanna stay on top of what is being presented to your kids, that's that's a good way to go. And? There's the Brave books, which I absolutely love this series of books. It, they're, they're based on raising a growth mindset child. Um, instead of saying, I can't, it's I can't yet. I didn't this time. It's, it's focused on helping children to overcome their, their self-doubt and their fears. But the Brave books are fantastic for parents and children to go through together yeah. because they're conversation starters. Uh, anything that you look up under growth mindset is going to take you to some very valuable resources. There's conversation starter cards, which we actually used with our girls. We'd put them in the middle of the table, and at, at dinner time, we'd pull out one card, and would you rather... And we would just start that to get connected. The main thing with parenting is make sure your children want to talk to you. If they mess up, if they do something that's not right, instead of going off on them, don't get mad. Let them talk to you about it. And then very calmly say, well, you know, there has to be consequences. I have to help you remember to do this. But they need to always feel that they can talk to you as a parent and that you are their safe spot not their safe spot that's going to defend them from all their wrongdoing but their safe spot that you're going to love them no matter what so those conversation starters are absolutely phenomenal and the dinner table is the best place to do it if you don't sit down as a family and have dinner i encourage yeah, you set aside at least one day a week it's on the calendar. This is family dinner night. Yeah. Don't make plans. You will have to cancel them. We are sitting down together. Good. We also need to remember the parents are human too. How many of you parents have never made a mistake in parenting? None of us can raise our hands. None. We need to be human in front of our kids. And what that really means is when we mess up as parents, we need to let our kids know we messed up. I apologize. I did it wrong. So it's going to change from here on out. Man, that is so good. This has been so good today. It is. And to add to that, I would say be intentional. Yeah. Be intentional about connecting with your, with your child. Yeah. Think of things they like to do. Think of things not just, well, I'm going to do this. I'll invite them to join me. No, you join them and, and be intentional. Very good today. Thank you for joining us. I'm so excited about today's service. I know it's going to be amazing. We have reserved these first rows for our children, but parents, you heard that. They need your laughter, and they need you to join in and worship with these kids. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being with us in Life Talks, and we're excited about today. To you have time to get your kids. First of all, get the teachers kids. will appreciate that. And then go ahead and grab a donut and some coffee and fellowship. We'll see you back here at 11. God bless you.